Um, with that, I am really excited to introduce um, Peter Scornia, who is president of Bazani Building Company. And if you don't know, Bazani was a co-founder of the Green Home Institute. So we're always excited to continue the partnership of working with them in any way that we can. Um, now, Peter, uh, he, he has worked in design and construction industry for owners, designers, contractors, developers on projects in over 20 states. These projects include new construction, renovation, office, residential, educational, medical markets ranging in costs from less than 100,000 to over $10 million. Also a shout out to, I don't believe anyone's here from there, but Catalyst Partners, who's working as the lead Green Raiders on this particular project that we're gonna be talking about. And I was excited to be serving as the lead AP on this particular project. Um, so with that, uh, Peter, you're, I assume you're, hopefully you're there with us, probably hiding, because we're going to play a little bit of a video for you all right now. Um, and then we'll uh, hand it off to, to Peter and go from there. So thank you. This conference will now be recorded. Hi, my name is Peter Scornia, president of Bazani Building Company. I'm standing at the corner of Lafayette and Bradford in the northeast side of Grand Rapids in front of Bradford Station. Bradford Station is a 24 unit mixed use building. Uh, we have one retail space here, and then we have 23 apartments. Uh, that's the total for the building. It's a three-story building. We are uh, shooting for lead for gold, lead gold for homes, and we have achieved carbon neutrality on this building for operations, meaning that we weren't carbon neutral for the actual construction process, but for operations, once we turn it over, um, this building will be carbon neutral through the ISO 14001 standard. And uh, we'd love to take the opportunity to take you through. We're, we're looking at the outside of the building now, uh, the front along Lafayette. There's uh, four units along the front that have uh, outdoor balconies here. And uh, and then we'll, we'll go on inside and show you the inside of the units. This conference will now be recorded. We are now on the third floor in a typical one bedroom unit. We're looking out the west side. Each of the units has a, a small balcony, just enough to open the door and get some of the outdoors in. So we have a, a layout here of the kitchen. All of our All of our cabinets and countertops are in now. These units have an island. And we can also look up and see the guts of the HVAC system. So on the right, over the bathroom door, is the mini split for the HVAC. So this unit provides heating and cooling for the space. So the, the only part of the HVAC system that interconnects throughout the building is the line sets that go from this unit, the refrigeration lines that go up onto the roof. And then we have a compressor on the roof um, that, that creates the rest of that system. For our fresh air in the ceiling here, we see the energy recovery ventilator. So this guy is always running, bringing fresh air in from the outside, exchanging the energy with the stale air that's on the inside of the space that gets exhausted out. So we're always getting a constant um, uh, return or a constant uh, uh, circulation of fresh air into the space. And none of the air in this space is exchanged with any of the air or any ductwork outside of the space itself. So great for, uh, for a clean building to get both that, that uh, constant fresh air into the space and not exchanging or sharing any air with anybody else. Works great for a, a single bedroom apartment here, uh, since this is all one big open room. And then as we go to the bedroom, 
will look up and you see a register up at the ceiling. What that register does is pull air from the, from the common space, the living room here. There's a fan behind that unit in the wall that blows fresh air into the bedroom. So this gets us our bedroom uh, supplied with fresh air while only having one main unit for the, for the space. So that register down below, so you always have uh, fresh air getting blown into the space when that fan is on. And that fan is just controlled by a light switch. And then here's a, here's a view looking at the kitchen. Again, this one with an island. What we don't see here is when the stove goes in, there will be a shelf over the stove and a um, kitchen exhaust hood that just has a filter and, a, and uh, gets vented within the space. It does not get exhausted outside. And then the, the exhaust comes from the energy recovery ventilator, which is just a couple of feet away. Um, you know, what, uh, what made you choose, you know, what were your, what was your thoughts on sort of going with a ductless versus a ducted system? Um, was there any concern about, uh, or thoughts of having two heads, you know, one for each room? Yeah, we did look at that and found that the, the balance of overall efficiency and cost, it just made more sense to have just one unit. We figured that the, the space was small enough that to get a true zone control that you could have with multiple units, you weren't really going to get anyway. It just it didn't make sense for a roughly 750 square foot unit um, to have one zone where you're say keeping the temperature at 68 degrees and another zone where you're keeping it, you let it get as high as 73 or 74 or something in the summertime or vice versa in the wintertime. We just figured that that wasn't going to happen anyway with the size of the unit. So it was more efficient to just have have the, the, the one zone and then using that, uh, that, that in-wall fan to get us fresh air into the bedroom. The other thing that we had decided early on with this system of using just the mini splits for both heating and cooling as opposed to, well, excuse me, and that and an individual energy recovery ventilator in each unit. Whereas other buildings that we've done, we've had a, a central ERV that sits up on the roof, but that generally we have used with a, a gas preheat. And this building is 100% electric. We don't have any gas in the building. So that um, includes our appliances. You know, we have a gas, uh, or excuse me, we have an electric stove. Uh, we have we have an electric uh, um, condensing dryer. So we have laundry in each unit. And then of course the HVAC system is all electric. Um, what, is a, what is a condensing dryer for those who might not know? Yeah, so it's, um, in my simple mind, I think of it like an air conditioning system. It's, um, it has a coil on it that works like an evaporator coil um, that as the, uh, as the, the clothes are drying, rather than um, having a fan and a vent that pushes all of that air outside, this, uh, this condensing unit that's part of the dryer collects all that moisture, condenses, hence the name, and goes down the drain. Uh, and it's great for uh, for a unit this size uh, because uh, because a dryer is a you know it's a pretty big fan it's exhausting a lot of air so um, in the in the summertime or in the wintertime you're not exhausting all of that uh, air out of your space that you just paid money or put energy into either heating or cooling. Um, is there any concern on the? mini splits for just keeping up in really cold winter time? Yeah, they're definitely, I, I should say there definitely was. Um, that technology has been around for a long time, um, but in colder climates like ours, the concern when you're in heating mode, since you're, you know, you're, you're, you're pulling heat out of air that is only 
you know, when it's really cold outside, it's only five degrees, there's not a lot of heat in that air. Um, and there is still a condensation process to that. So the coils can freeze up. And if those coils freeze up and that system shuts down, you don't have any heat. There's no heat in your space. Um, so a couple of things we've done. One, the, the Mitsubishi system that we're using has a, an electric system on it that will defrost those coils. And that happens automatically. So it'll sense that moisture, it'll sense that ice buildup, shuts itself off for a little bit and goes into a heating mode and that um, that melts the ice away or prevents the ice from building up. So the Mitsubishi system has that to where it operates down to negative five, I think, or it maintains its efficiency down to negative five. And, and Brett, you know those statistics. You helped us put this plan together, uh, but we felt comfortable with that. Um, the other thing that we did as a, as a backup, and I'm walking into the, the bathroom here, we have a small electric heater that goes in each bathroom. It's on a timer, it's, um, it goes right below the towel rack, which personally I just love the idea of, is that you get up in the morning, you step into the shower, you, you flip that thing on, so it keeps, the, it, it keeps the room up nicely. And then when you're done in the shower, your, your towel's um, toasty warm. It also serves as a backup. It's a 1500 um, watt unit. If, um, boy, if, if everything that Mitsubishi tells us about the backups, if the backups also fail and then a unit goes down and stuff happens, well then in the dead of winter, you can just turn that bathroom fan on and it'll keep your unit warm until they, uh, until they get out and get the Mitsubishi units fixed. This conference will now be recorded. Uh, Peter, you had mentioned, uh, so your all electric apartment units, um, so the stove, what kind of cooking did you go with? I know induction's kind of becoming kind of trendy. Did you guys look at that? We did look at it. We did have a price point that we needed to hit. So we did not go for the induction stove. It's electric, um, but they do make a very economical uh, and pretty, pretty darn energy efficient stove. Um, ours is GE that has the glass top. Um, so, so we're not going back to the oil, um, the electric coil, you know, that, that, you know, always used to associate with an electric stove. Um, it's a, uh, it's a smooth glass top, which is great, but we did not do the induction stove. And then as far as, you know, even without gas, removing some of the pollutants from the cooking, you're just relying on that energy recovery ventilator, right? To handle that. Yeah, so the energy recovery ventilators are only exhaust out of the space. Yeah. Um, and that would serve as a, as a kitchen exhaust, but we did add a, a um, kitchen exhaust hood that just has a filter on it. So it's got a charcoal filter that, um, you know, if you burn the beans, you flip that thing on, it filters, the, uh, filters that air, gets it away from the stove, and then shoots it up towards the the uh, exhaust fan, really, the, the ERV unit. This conference will now be recorded. Um, so, Peter, while we still have you at the building, you know, aspects of living a lower carbon life, a zero carbon life and lead, you know, look into connectivity of the community and being able to get around, you know, without traditional transportation. Can you tell us a little bit how this project fits into that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a big part of that is is location. So uh, we'll walk through the unit here and we'll show where you can where you can see outside and show where it is. We are just up the road from uh, GBSU's uh, medical complex and the and the hospital. Um, and from a carbon footprint standpoint, so this building is carbon neutral for for operations of the building itself. So for somebody that lives here. Their, their living conditions are already taken care of. And then if they were looking for their own personal goals of, of um, reaching a carbon neutral, true carbon neutral lifestyle, then they would look at transportation. You know, what kind of vehicle do they drive and, um, and how many miles do they drive? So living here, we think we've got a great opportunity for people to live without a car. So we're, uh, we're at the balcony here. We can look out. So this is looking to the south, and you can see the hospital complex at the top of the hill there. That's Medical Mile. Um, so walkable, definitely bikeable. There's a couple of bus stops 
right outside, or well, just south of, just south of Bradford there. So it's a, it's a great way to, it's a great way to live um, close to downtown, uh, beyond the bus line. You have Kingma's right up the street for grocery. And then, you know, as I said, you're, you're, you're walkable or certainly bikeable or bus uh, to downtown and all the things that Grand Rapids has to offer. And are you all leased up on this one? No, no, we're not. We're not. We're not. As you can see, we're not quite through with construction yet. So we have. Um, we're, we're taking orders. We Got turn it. it to the third floor in the next uh, several weeks. Great. Well, uh, I think uh, we can take questions uh, from the audience and then dive into any other things with uh, some stuff with the plan. So thanks, Peter. Thank you. All right, Peter, I'm gonna turn it over to you right now um, and feel free to take it away and then we'll get into Q&A, thanks. Oh, and you're still muted, so. There you go. Okay, sorry about that, thank you, Brett. Um, okay, so we'll jump into um, the benefits of zero carbon design and construction for, for Bradford Station. And what was so exciting at the beginning, uh, listening to Dr. Brown and the, the goal of, um, of Michigan for being carbon neutral uh, by 2050. And then we're in the, the 2030 uh, district here with the city of Grand Rapids. Um, and with, with Bradford Station, well, we were able to hit that goal in 2020. And we'll talk through a little bit of, of what we did and how that work for our building. Um, and we show the Hentrex carbon market. That is the, the system that we use, the process that we went through for certification on our um, on carbon neutrality for the building. And again, for operations. And so um, we are, uh, Bazani Building Company is a uh, certified B Corp and uh, within the, the our project here is part of the 2030 district lead for homes here's some more information about Hentrex. so the um talk a little bit about the the process for for getting to zero we can reduce the the emissions and get to zero in the operation of the building if we take some relatively simple steps one and uh, and john had certainly hit on this build more efficient um buildings and convert to all electric. And I love that, that quote from David Roberts of um, by, by going to all electric now, even if some of our electricity is coming from um, fossil fuels, over the life cycle of the building, as that grid changes and goes to a higher renewable content, your building proceeds right along with it. So getting a good thermal envelope, um, being right sized. And so this is an apartment building, um, trying to balance the, the overall size of the apartment, keeping it small with, with the needs of the tenants, but just, just making every space count. Um, energy efficient, all electric heating, cooling, and uh, hot water systems. Right sized appliances um, that, again, uh, sizing everything for what the use of the, uh, the space is. And then getting our electricity from renewable sources. Boy, fantastic if, if people, whether on their homes or, or for a commercial building, can produce their own. But if we can't, um, work with the utility provider so that the, the energy that you're getting from the grid is coming from a renewable source or verified uh, renewable energy credits. And, and then the final step for, for getting to uh, net zero carbon is through um, uh, purchasing offsets. So we're reducing the um, the, the consumption of uh, um, offsets, or excuse me, of greenhouse gas emissions as much as we can through those other steps. You get it down as low as possible, but there's still always going to be something left. You know, we've got we've got water. Water has a uh, um, a carbon footprint. We have we have some electricity from the grid, so that so the balance of that is is purchasing offsets. Um, 
in, in, in our case, we use the Entrex market. And something we've talked about on some of the other uh, programs is creating local carbon offsets, having some that are available in, in Michigan. Uh, not currently an option, but uh, there are people working on it. So again, these are the, some of the steps that we went through for Bradford Station. And we wanted to point out that it's a, this is a market rate building. We didn't have any grants. There wasn't any, any assistance in the development cost. It's um, that, that we can be environmentally responsible and profitable without, um, without making this a, a special one-off project that, uh, that needs government or philanthropic efforts. Um, so we just, we just went through the tour. I don't need to spend too much time on the uh, uh, on the footprint here, but uh, again, maybe focusing in on some of the HVAC systems that uh, by doing that uh, ductless mini split with the energy recovery ventilator, you've got a self-contained HVAC system within each apartment. You're not mixing air at all with any of the any of the common spaces, or you don't have any any interconnected uh, ductwork. Fresh air is is a is a big part of this. Um, you know, we certainly encourage people to open their windows in the um, in the shoulder seasons, and and having the uh, uh, sliding glass door that you can open get some of the outside air in. But that's not going to happen in the winter time or in when it's really cold or in the summertime when it's really hot. So this energy recovery ventilator system um, gets you constant fresh air into the space and capturing that energy of the, um, the air in the space that you have just heated or cooled, depending on the time of the year, uh, capture that before it gets exhausted out. The heating and cooling, and, and after John did such a great job of his presentation of describing how the, uh, the, the mini split heat pump works, we use Mitsubishi on this and um, have had uh, a very good experience with it. Here's a, here's a floor plan showing that um, the unit. So when we, when we did the tour, we walked in, we saw the mini split, um, the, the head here, the, the wall mount one, and, and then the fan moving air into the, into the bedroom. The ERV that sits um, in basically in the kitchen and that exhausts uh, stale air out, brings fresh air in. And then we have an exhaust fan in the in the bathroom that's just 100% exhaust. And that runs off of uh, humidistat or, um, or, a, or a switch. A few other things we're doing. Um, we put the, and this, this was on the tour, we put a heater in each bathroom. Um, and uh, but I but I love Courtney's comment about not doing um, electric resistant. That is a space that we have that. So that's a space that we can improve on efficiency um, in the future. But it's pretty small and it doesn't run all the time. The bathroom with its an exhaust fan run off of the humidistat. And then the laundry. And we talked a little bit about the uh, the ventless dryers on the on the tour. The last and more and most important design consideration is uh, the tenants who are going to occupy our building. So trying to keep in balance everything about uh, being able to reach a, a very energy efficient uh, target and 100% carbon neutral, but still have um, you know, an attractive uh, exterior, desirable interior finishes, useful amenities, bicycle storage, porch and patio units. Uh, fiber optic throughout the building, and then a healthy building, 100% fresh air, no recirculation between the units. Uh, a quick recap on, on B Corp, that uh, I love the opportunity to talk about it, uh, is basically um, built on the triple bottom line philosophy of, of, of all of our projects addressing people, planet, and, and profit. Um, boy, and again, back to uh, Dr. Brown that started the, the session today talking about what uh, Michigan is doing. I think that just, in, I wrote it down because it was that, that um, protecting health and the environment 
uh, for the state that as it encourages uh, more people to move in. And I, I think that just lines up so, so well with this, that protecting the health, we're concerned about the people, the environment is, is of course, is the planet connection. And then as more people move in, that's more profitable for our state. So I think a great triple bottom line use there. And uh, we mentioned offsets. Uh, this is the, the, the last part of um, carbon neutrality is that we, we can't really get to zero unless you're completely off the grid. Um, so we need to purchase offsets to, to get to that, to that zero point. And again, we don't, have, we don't have local offsets yet, but there's some really cool things that are going on and as we, as we keep this process going, that's going to become a reality. And um, I love the idea of it because it's a reinvestment in your local community that helps drive down um, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions or uh, specifically related to construction or other things like how are we dealing with trash and uh, how are we dealing with our, um, with our, with our local energy grid. And as again, as as, uh, as John was saying, is that energy grid becomes more efficient, and we we're, we're weaning ourselves off of natural gas and getting to 100% renewables. That just uh, it it um, makes it better for all of the the buildings within that grid. And, um, so, in summary, the process that we're going through is um, is first measuring our carbon what's involved in what are the greenhouse gas emissions associated with a, you know, in this case for Bradford Station, a, uh, a multifamily residential building. What are those greenhouse gas emissions? Measure them for the project, purchase offsets to get you down so that you're, you're, you're net zero. But then it's an ongoing process. What can you do in the future to reduce the, um, to the emissions? As a result of that, you're purchasing less offsets, and that continuous improvement process then just gets us closer and closer. The uh, the final thing I'll just hit on is is I mentioned a couple of times that we are focused um, strictly on operations for the building, um, which is um, scope one and two in in um, direct emissions associated with the uh, the facility itself, once we're up and operating, and then indirect associated with electricity that we purchase off of the off the grid. Um, what the next step that we're really trying to focus on is um, the uh, is is the carbon associated with the construction process itself. So what's everything that goes into um, the, the production of all of the materials, getting all of the materials to the site, um, the, uh, the construction activities, and um, developing all that, getting an assessment of it. What are the what are the emissions associated with all of those activities? And then that's really where the continuous improvement process is going to come in. Of, of how do we how do we try to reduce emissions associated with those? A lot of things that LEED has been uh, pushing us for uh, towards four years of um, encouraging um, purchase of local um, materials so that we don't have a lot of uh, um, emissions associated with transportation um, and then reducing the um, it just in general the, the, the carbon footprint of each of the, the things that go into making up our building. So a quick recap on this is um, why renewable energy? Boy, again, that's that's um, clear from whether whether we're producing it ourselves or we're getting it from our grid. We're in a we're in a process of increasing that amount of renewable, and each each step towards that is reducing our our, our carbon emissions. We can do that through uh, building design and construction. First, we're reducing the amount of energy we need. And then our then our power source getting to maximizing the amount of renewables, and then a final step for getting to carbon zero was uh, was um, purchasing offsets.
Thanks, Peter. We um, got some questions coming in. You stick around for some for some questions here with us. Absolutely. Great. Um, there I am. So uh, yeah. So I think we you we covered um, you know HVAC, heating, cooling, ventilation through what you're doing with your project. Um, but what about water heating? What's your strategy there? I mean, are you going tankless? Uh, is it electric, gas? What do you got for water heating? Yeah, for this project, we did individual electric water heaters in each unit. Um, and uh, looking back on, on the project, the things we would have done differently, that is one we would do differently. So for the next project we're going to do, we're going to do a, um, a, um, a heat pump system for the water heaters. And uh, we'll put in... Um, rather than doing one per unit we'll do still be multiple multiple water heaters uh but then an overall central loop you know. um so you know using uh ductless mini splits air source heat pump systems for a large building like this we see some projects using uh, geothermal systems was that into the consideration at all um through the design process um we we did um we ended up not from a from a cost standpoint and i think it might have been the timing of it because we did call, talk to courtney about it um but we were a little too far along in the design so we still really love the presentation today and as john pointed out boy that is that is more efficient than the system that we do have still an option but we weren't able to do it on this project yeah yeah absolutely um so a question here is, is this project scalable based on cost of design and the targeted market audience of people that want to live in a one bedroom apartment or is this really just sort of a special one-off project? No, I think it's absolutely scalable. Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything about the, the size of this project that wouldn't work larger or smaller. You know? Um, I think the things that, um, as, as the building would get bigger, impact some other code things related to, um, well, you get taller, the need for an elevator. We we're a three-story building. We didn't do an elevator. Um, potentially, there would be some backup um, for, for a larger building that we didn't need to have with our size that you would have to get in and measure, but, um, uh, but, but nothing that isn't. Um, that isn't doable. Um, so a zero carbon building, do you have um, solar panels on this project? I mean, what do you, um, you, you know, is that a part of the project? Are there any any plans to get it? Um, is it is it solar ready? What, what, what are some of the barriers or opportunities for, for solar on a project like this to actually be physically on it? Yep, yep, we had a, we had a couple barriers. One, the this, this, the uh, the location of the building, we're kind of on the side of a hill. We did do an analysis with it, Brett, with your help, um, and found that we could we could probably hit about 40% of our power requirement if we cover the whole roof with solar. The uh, the parking lot is pretty small and is completely in uh, shaded. It just that wasn't going to add anything. Um, and then this was a this was a learning for me uh, of, of the, the process of how solar is, is used in a multifamily um, uh, setting and how it's metered. Um, consumers helped us as, as we went through the process. And so what we ended up doing was, was pushing towards, okay, we're not gonna generate our own power. We're gonna get grid power. But then with that, knowing that we've got grid power, which is, I, I don't know what it is exactly, 20% maybe uh, renewable. How can we get to 100% renewable through um, either the solar gardens program that consumers has, or they're coming out with some new, some changes to their large customer program, um, or renewable energy credits, where as a result of your project, you're adding the solar capacity that's going into the grid. And to me, that is, even though you're not generating your own electricity and consuming it directly on your site, as a result of your project, you're increasing the amount of renewable energy that's available. That's meeting the same goal. 
and from the the certification process that we went through um, for the for, uh, through Entrex and there they have a third party verifier that goes through to meet the ISO compliance. That's what they're looking for. Um, yeah, speaking of that, um, what are you doing to continue to maintain the you know, zero carbon operations of this building. Are, are you all going to be involved in that? Or is that something being handed off to another owner and you, you have some plans in place to maintain that? Yeah, so we were the builder on it, but then um, but then also the ownership of Bazani is the ownership team for, for the building. So um, as the owner, then every year we have to go through that, that certification process. And it's measured in a few ways. Um, the... Uh, through the actual electric, um, we will collect that from consumers. So we'll know total kilowatt hours over the over the year, and then we measure the amount of water, um, put that into a formula, and that's through the third party verifier. And then they tell us, okay, how much, uh, they go through that conversion process, tell us what our total um, greenhouse gas emissions were, and then, and then we need to purchase offsets to, to change that. Um, and also with that, hopefully we'll, we'll see, you know, this is the, this is the first one that we've done. Um, we'll, we'll keep in touch with our, with our tenants and pass that information back to them. Hopefully they're excited about it. You know? And then, and then with that, there's a, there's a drive towards, um, uh, reducing, reducing their energy consumption. Uh, and it kind of goes back to the question of the water heater too, that I think on the next project that we do, um, we'll want to track, uh, and then by, by having um, a, uh, a central H or a central uh, hot water loop that gets tracked how much each tenant uses, I we'll want to do the same thing for domestic water and um, start to focus on that of um, reducing our water consumption by actually tracking it and reporting that back and trying to set some goals, you know, that, that tenants can respond to. Um, so, you know, you really, uh, you know, interestingly, or, or in my opinion, you know, you started designing a project that's really going to protect against viral spread, even before you knew it was a, you know, an issue uh, back in the day, right? You, you were kind of alluding to it a little bit with ventilation but you know lead requires also tight compartmentalization and so the big fear is that anything that might be in another unit or in the hallway you know in traditional standard practices even today if i understand right you know people are putting that kind of cut under the door and using the hallway ventilation right for their for their units um and so you know the lead requirements in your own standard process you know allow you to avoid that so can you speak a little bit to the tightness of the unit, not just for energy efficiency sake, but, um, you know, for, for the, for the health, especially health and comfort of the occupants. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we talked about it, but from a health standpoint that it's, um, all of the, the air within the space is, um, and the, the air circulation is done within the unit. You know, you're pulling air directly in from outside and, um, uh, is circulating within the space via the energy recovery ventilator. So then that, that exhaust goes right out and, uh, plus the bathroom exhaust. You're not relying on air coming in from the, from the corridor, you know, which is common space. Um, and you're not relying on tenants to leave there to open the windows if they need fresh air. Um, so certainly helps from the health standpoint and also the car, Compartmentalization also helps with, you know, multifamily building of um, uh, for sound. Right. That, that that you're not getting a lot of sound transmission from uh, um, from apartment to apartment. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, we've got about you know five minutes left. If folks have any other any other questions here, um, you know, Bazani, I assume you're going to keep on building. What uh, what's what's next for you all? Uh, in regards to you know zero net energy construction, what's on the horizon? Yeah, so we just bought a building that's a um, it was an old storage building built in the in the mid twenties, um, and absolutely want to that it will be all electric. It will be um, net zero carbon. Um, 
where where I would like to see improvements on our side is again in the measurement of carbon during the construction process, really evaluating all of the materials um, and equipment that go into our into our buildings. I think there's a lot of room for improvement there. Um, and and we talked about water. Um, I think both from a efficiency of heating water and also just in general, how much water are we using? Um, I think LEED does some great stuff on that of setting it up in the beginning for um, making sure that uh, that our appliances are efficient and stuff and our, and our faucets are. Um, but something we haven't traditionally done is measured it afterwards. You know, it's uh, we take water we take water for granted. We have typically it's included in everybody's rent. You have one water meter where it comes into the into the building, and that's what we have at Bradford. Um, but on the next building, I really want to get to where not that not that we have to charge our, our our tenants for water. It's I don't think we're to that point yet. But but at least measure it, and then it'd be cool to do some interactive things with tenants to see, you know, you, you set goals for them or something. You know, you know, I'm glad you brought up water again um, because I think you and I had this conversation maybe a year ago. Um, but uh, you know, water, especially on a municipal level every time you pull it from the plant it results in energy right um, to clean that water to transfer that water um, to bring it back to you know the whole supply chain of chlorinating and fluorinating water has carbon emissions associated with it so Absolutely. i guess my question is does your does the zero carbon program that you're following require you to to you know offset water usage in that context um, at all? Is that something you've looked at or is that something you hope to maybe take a look at as well? Yeah, it does. So on Bradford, it's we're not doing it on a unit by unit, on an apartment by apartment basis because we've just certified the entire building. Um, but yeah, yeah, we've uh, we made a guess at, at how much water we're going to use and we purchased offsets for our first year based on that amount of water. Um, so the the way we can control it is everything we've talked about, right? And stuff that that that, that we typically do. Um, but then at the at the end of next year, after we've had a full year of operations, then we have to turn in all of our utilities, and we'll have to put in and say, "Yep, we use this many gallons," and that will, um, you know, hopefully be less than what we predicted or close to what we predicted. But if it's more, then we purchase more offsets. Yeah. Oh, I lost sound, Brett. I'm not hearing. All right. You. I said that's really great to hear, and I'm excited to to learn more about that. Um, the last question before we we transition, hand it off, kind of going back to your future plans and mentioning water heaters. Uh, glad to see you, Sean Armstrong, here on our session. He's been on one of our webinars before. Really cool to have you here, Sean. He really wants to know about what you're planning to do with heat pump water heaters, if you want to share anything with that, if you have any ideas. Um, have you looked at what kind of strategies you use? He's saying, you know, whether it be a multi-tank setup or split system, or have you gotten that far along yet on some of your next projects? No, and I really need help from the experts. Um, yeah. You know, we've done, um, I, I think we're to the point, I would love the idea of being able to put a system in that is, um, that is tied in directly with the HVAC system. So mm -hmm. in the summertime, when you're 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 extracting all of that heat out of your space, and through the you know through the mini split, you're 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 just dumping it out into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Boy, wouldn't mm -hmm. it be cool if you could dump it right into the water? Um, yeah. And we're starting to evaluate those, but um, haven't we're not there yet. I just know we need to do something other than individual um, thirty or forty gallon tanks. Yeah. And that's the other side is that it just they use up a lot of space. In a small apartment, you know, to use up all that space for a for a water tank is, is right. a little silly. Well, I know Sean, you think about this all day long. So he said he's happy to help if you have any questions and give you some advice. So he can I'll put you in contact after this. So oh, fantastic. Um, yeah, thank you. Peter, we are at our time. Uh thank you so much for joining us tonight and doing that earlier walkthrough with me um and educating us on what you're doing. And uh Hope to see the project finish and be able to visit it maybe for a tour in real life someday uh, in the following year. So thank you so much. Absolutely, Brett. Thank you.